Um, I'm Dr. Colleen Kelly. Hi. Um, I'm from the United States. I've lived here two years. Does anyone have French headphones on, or is everyone English speaking? I think everyone's okay. Oh, great. Okay, because I, I was going to try to talk slow and not <laughs> torture the translators. Um, so I started. I'm a, a psychologist. And I work with families and couples, high conflict couples in addiction. Um, <clears throat> I worked in Malibu at Promises Malibu as the family director. Uh, I'm going to keep water near me. Sorry. I started their family program, and I ran it for about seven years, and then I would create family programs at different centers um, in California. So what I thought we'd talk about, I know there's, we're all splitting into small groups, and it's kind of fast, but is working with families through an attachment theory lens and solution-focused. Um, Philippe actually titled this, um, my, t my talk, I read it, and he said the, the problem, the solution is in the problem. And I was like, okay, so I guess I'll go with solution therapy. So we're going to do a little bit of solution techniques. Um, the first slide I have is on attachment theory. Is everyone super familiar with attachment theory, or should I just nutshell it? So you, you know what it is, that it was Bowlby created it. Um, he discovered during the war that uh, orphans who had proper medical care, who had all the um, education they needed, the housing, they were still dying as children and not thriving and their brains weren't developing. So they realized that that connection that we are wired to attach from the moment we're born, our wiring is to the mom and to the dad and to caregivers to love us. And that's really the, the way the brain develops. And without it, um, <clears throat> there's a severe uh, failure to thrive. So what we've noticed, we've known that for a long time, but now we can see that attachment is at the basis, it goes right into adulthood. And we see it as the basis for addiction. Um, I, I've written papers on it being the basis for domestic violence as an attachment um, disorder. So we can really trace a lot of disorders back to um, a failure to attach or to have that proper caregiver. Unfortunately, I need uh, glasses. So. Um, once Bowlby studied this, that's when science became, we, we, this would always be a theory, and we could always say, like, oh, it comes from the mother, and, and love is healing. But until they started to, to um, look at it scientifically, that's when science became very interested in the brain and into attachment. So it started back as far as Bowlby. Um, let me move ahead. So that's where we get to the neurobiology of addiction, that it's not just a theory anymore. It's like we can trace with the brain that... When we're under a threat, whether it's real or perceived, it, our bodies, our brains react the same way. That's when you know, Shakespeare's, uh, I'm not going too fast, a coward dies a thousand deaths, means if you wake up every morning positive you're going to lose your job and you go to the office, you lose that job every day because the brain is sending off signals and chemicals and believing this is happening. So when we have a threat, if we have an insecure attachment and we're like, my spouse is leaving, that person's leaving every day, and that person is living it each day again and again. So that's where attachment theory comes in with the brain, that it doesn't have to be happening or not. So when, where we used to, um, if we just approached it through cognitive behavioral therapy, we're like, well, this isn't happening, or snap that. But the brain, it, we can't use the prefrontal cortex that does logic and reasoning to override that primal wound. Because when that's triggered, it's like it's not going to listen to like, but they're not leaving me, they're right here. We have to really reparent and, and um, work on that attachment as adults even that we didn't get before. So when you're with your clients, an individual or family, you can track where they are in their attachment through changes in their body, how, how panicked they are, what they're perceiving. You'll, you've seen with clients when someone will say something like, um, you know, a spouse introduces something new and the other person is like, the, the rug has been pulled out. They are completely fragmenting. So you can tell through their bodily changes, their, their temperature, how they're sitting, what's happening inside of them. So we can tell what the brain is sending off. And it's really helpful to say to them, like, don't, at that moment, you don't have to ask, like, how do you feel? It's like, what's happening in your body? Like, hand on your heart right now, what's going on? Because if we can start to realize if they can start to see, I feel like this warmth flooding over me and my heart's racing and tears are coming, that's a lot more accessible than, well, I'm thinking that by them saying that, it means it's very hard to get to that in the moment. So um, alcoholic families, when we get to this attachment, they live in constant fear and uncertainty. And they believe that fixing this one patient is going to solve it. 
It's going to be the one thing that takes away this constant fear and living on eggshells. <clears throat> so they tend to mobilize and focus on the patient. Um, as close as they seem, addiction is really the antidote to intimacy. We, we, we can feel, I always tell people, don't confuse intensity for intimacy. Don't confuse that like, you know, I can't live without this person, or oh my God, we have to save them, but this is how close we are. That's the intensity. What well, true intimacy is more fluid and is open. So what we want to do is help families move into a healthier place than where they're stuck at, in this like a, a prison that they're in. So um, what they've noticed in studying just the brain regarding um, fear and pain, and, and obviously it, it relates to addiction because that's constant fear and pain. So living in this state, um, you, can, you can see attachment. Um, we we want to be able to go to our partner or our parents for comfort. And, and that's 80% out of the time that might work. 20% it can't work, so we have to be able to self-soothe. So we have to help our clients be able to self-soothe. Sometimes our partners aren't available. In addiction, 5 or 10% of the time they're going to be available. So we're working with families who are not, no one's getting their needs met. So um, to, to look at this just from a biological standpoint, I put down, you can see Dr. Sue Johnson's website. She did a study that um, was amazing. They, hooked up, a, a woman volunteered to do this, they hooked up electrodes to her ankle, they gave her quite a zap, a pretty powerful zap. And um, she got the zap and she was in an MRI studying her brain as it happened. And then they had um, a tech come over and hold her hand while she got the zap. Not, not, a mu not much change, maybe a little tiny bit better. Then he ha they had her husband come over and hold her hand and they gave her the zap. And not a lot changed, it was about the exact same as the tech. Then they went off and they did an attachment style family therapy session where they helped the couple have an experience and really get in touch with the power of their connection to each other. And then they went back and they had her husband hold her hand and she asked why they weren't doing the zap. She didn't feel it at all. So our attachment to each other alters our pain receptors. It's incredible, it's not just you know, it makes me feel a little emotionally better, it alters the physical pain that we feel, having a secure attachment to someone. So it's, it's so vital that that's what we're going for in our families. Um, that, so that's what I believe in starting with, that we want to see when we see a family, we want to first as assess for what's everyone's level of differentiation, what's their attachment. And if it's an alcoholic family, it's going to be pretty fractured. So we want to see who can tolerate this, who can't, where, where is it at. Um, Next. Okay, because addiction, I had to put this up because I love uh, Gabor Mate so much. I studied with him in Los Angeles for many years. But drinking in every culture it, it has its meaning. I thought this quote about Ireland really sums up, uh, I'm Irish, sums up addiction for everybody, uh, for alcoholism. Whenever I say alcoholism, I mean addiction. That drinking in Ireland is not simply a convivial pastime. It is a ritualistic alternative to real life, a spiritual placebo, a fumble for eternity, a longing for heaven, a thirst for the embrace of the Almighty. I think it describes, better than any quote I've seen, that empty hole that we have in alcoholism and addiction with our families and, and uh, who we see. It, um, it goes beyond an allergy to needing alcohol, it goes beyond mental, it goes beyond an obsession, it, that's when we get, we, we're talking about meaning and that profound, deep, empty hole that partly we can see with attachment. It's primal. It's something we didn't get in early childhood for whatever reason. Somebody might have had a mom who was depressed, and every time they went to her, she just couldn't be there. It's not a condemnation of the mom. That's just realizing this kid at some point gave up and realized I don't matter or like made all these um, assumptions about themselves and has this wound that they're carrying that 30 years later when their spouse isn't available, they're like, oh God, it's right back. And what fills that, I can, I can tell you I have 26 years sober. I remember the first time drinking at age 11 and being like, oh my God, this is what God must feel like. Like the warmth and the pain was gone. And so it's that hole that's there that like, if, if someone has a predisposition genetically, 
social, socially, ec ethnically, psychologically, all the factors that go into addiction. If we have that predisposition and we have that hole, the minute we take something in, it's like, oh, becomes the answer till it almost kills us. But it's, it's got that quality that what we're really searching for is that attachment to another person or that ability to self-soothe and just and feel like attached in our, ourselves and grounded. So that's the attachment part. Talking about um, family therapy and couples therapy, they, when people go to treatment, we get them for 30 days and the family's like, thank God, they're safe for 30 days. I can sleep at night. They're not going to be in a car accident. They're not going to die. But it's just the beginning. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Because if they go back to that family and there isn't a change in the family, unfortunately, the family can do a lot more to, to cause someone to relapse or to contribute to a relapse than they can to get someone sober. So it's so important that we work with the families. It, it, while they're in treatment, while they're out of treatment, to get them in treatment, just as much healing has to happen with the family. Um, I know this is some later slides, but we, we have to look at families like the human body. It's, um, it's systemic. So if I broke my right ankle, my whole body is going to adjust to not step on it, and everything's going to be out of whack. So it's like when, when people come into treatment, they're like, just leave my family out. I'm like, that's like if you came to a heart uh, you know, a cardiologist, and they saw that your liver's damaged. And you're like, just deal with my heart. It's like the body's not going to, we have to do the whole system, or it's just not going to work, because it's so easy to slip back. The brain is wired to do what it knows to do. It's almost like if you drive to work a certain way every day, which is why most accidents happen near the home. If you drive a certain way, your brain goes into automatic, and it just takes that freeway. Then we're asking it to take something different, and every time there's any kind of stress, it's going to do what it knows to do. So it'll always go back. So we're really teaching people a whole new way to live. And we have to work with each family member. Because addiction is truly a family. Yeah, you could call it, you could say a disease. I know it's not popular here in America. We say a disease. Whatever you want to call it, a disorder. It's a family issue. You know, and everyone's equally affected. If you have an alcoholic, they have the bottle. And they're obsessed with that, about when they're going to have it, when they're not going to have it. And if you have a family member, they're obsessed with that alcoholic. Are they drinking? Are they going to meetings? What's happening? It's the same exact obsession. Which is why we have Al-Anon and AA and the same powerlessness. So we really are all in the same exact addiction, the same brain being wired to like, this will fix it. This will be the answer. So to have families come in in so much pain, explain to them, even starting with the family, that you could change, you could be the catalyst. Often the families are the point of change and don't worry about them. You know, like your changing could be the thing that starts the whole change in the family to get them off the addict. And to do it, this is when we'll get into positive um, therapy, to do it in a way that bolsters the family and says to them, what you've done so far is amazing. It's like when we have an individual client, we're like, God, you survived that? Like the coping skills you came up with are amazing. They're not working now. But we want to like build them up and show them their strengths and resilience. And when they came together around alcohol, it was like, well, this is what kept you together as a family. Like how can we do that in a healthier way? So it's changing, the, it's reframing addiction in that way that it, we have to take the stigma out. Especially every, like, it starts with us as therapists. We have to end the stigma of addiction. It's a worldwide epidemic. It's killing, it kills 60,000 people a year just in France, alcoholism. We have to think about it. If one of us um, had a child who was a diabetic, and we were, and as, as therapists, we wrote to their high school or their college, and we said, you know, they um, had a really rough time their senior year. They developed type 1 diabetes. They failed some classes, but they're really smart, like we're getting back together. That's a letter we wouldn't mind writing. The college would be like, what can we do? But can you imagine writing that same letter, even what we know, and saying, you know, my daughter got involved drinking. It progressed to crystal meth. She starts stealing stuff. She's in rehab now. Like, this is a stigmatizing letter that nobody feels good about, even us today. It's like, there's no way you're going to tell a parent this is completely not your fault. It's like we as parents feel responsible. There's no way. So the more as clinicians we know this parent is in pain, you know, they're going to feel that to like, we have to stop the stigma. We're the, we're the front line in this war. 
and stopping the stigma and talking about it and making it like it was diabetes or, or anything else, that this is something we're here to help you with and there was no shame in it. So uh, that's my little uh, stigma. <laughs> um, of course, there's risks in couples therapy. Um, you want to assess that no one feels attacked, which they probably will. Um, anger and violence in a violent couple can escalate, so you don't want to do couples therapy or family therapy when there's any domestic violence. You want to thoroughly screen each person. I like to meet with each person first, and then sometimes you might see the couple, the family, just the individual, and really split them all up and bring them together. Because when we're doing family therapy, you're not doing individual therapy with a bunch of people. You're seeing the family as the client. It's not, it's not sitting there, well, how do you feel about that? You have to be so much more involved, of course, and more of a traffic cop, and uh, get in there a lot more and keep them all safe. That's our number one responsibility to them. I, you guys can get all these slides from me, so I won't, I won't stay too long on certain, I want to get to a, okay, this is what we'll see in a typical alcoholic family. There's blurred boundaries, breakdown of communication, overprotection, or to permissiveness. They have no tolerance for stress, physical illness. They're fragmented. They're all the things we see here every day in our practice. So this is what we're up against, and this is what you want to assess for in every, every family you see. What's the level of these things, and where are they mostly stuck? So you're not going to have all, but you want to know who's in danger, uh, who can tolerate this, who has the ego strength for this, who can self-soothe a little bit. This is what we'll see in our families. The shame um, that comes up in every person, the addict themselves, the loved ones, everyone in the room, in their, in their family, in their own way, is having <clears throat> suppressed rage, self-loathing, low self-esteem, which we see with alcoholics, right? It's low self-esteem, then it's like, I'm like the, the shit, I'm the greatest thing. Then it's like completely the depths again. So it goes up and down, grandiosity. We'll see that with family members. What you'll see a lot with family members is rage, of course. I had a client before that I was placing at Betty Ford. And it was an older man. I said, I just want you to know it's 120 degrees in Palm Springs right now. And the wife said to me, he put me through hell, send him to hell. <laughs> so he went to Palm Springs in July. <laughs> but it's like, you can tell, like, at some point people are fed up and angry. So we want to really honor that and validate it and, and help them uh, work through that. Do you guys know the family roles, Virginia Satir? Yeah, she's amazing. You'll look at each family, and the roles aren't rigid. They can move around. People could do different ones. You have the dependent, or the, they used to say the identified patient, the alcoholic. Then there's usually someone who's the enabler. Who's, it'll, a lot of times you'll see it'll be like the mom or the wife like feeling like, I have to do this for him. I have to call work. He'll lose his job. I have to say he's sick. I have to say I'll write the paper for her. Like someone who's trying to like sweep up every mess, thinking they're helping, but keeping the person sick. Um, the hero is usually the child that's like just doing amazing, who's like, like staying above the fray. Those are the ones I worry about a lot. It's like the hero in the family. Um, the lost child is the one who just goes off, and, and, uh, and this can be adults too, obviously, goes off, gets lost at the book, goes in books, libraries, goes off and does their own thing, kind of separates. It was like, Jimmy's okay. Jimmy's off doing Jimmy's own thing. And Jimmy's not okay. All of these, the basis for them are shame and anger, and rage, and isolation. And um, the mascot is the clown, the person who always makes the jokes and tries to lighten things with something funny and keep peace. The mastermind is the person who can look back at this family and be like, how can they manipulate everybody and get the best they want? When is it best to pull out the mascot? It's like the puppeteer. So there's so many families who can be really good at knowing when to use who to get what they want. The scapegoat is not the dependent. The scapegoat is usually the one in the family who everyone blames for something, but they did nothing to, to get any blame. It's always like she probably broke it or she did it, but it's not the identified patient. It's not the person acting out. It's just someone who gets blamed for everything for absolutely no reason. The problem child is the one who's acting out with her rage. It could be the dependent. So we want to look at families and see... Who, who fits what? Because somebody takes on some of these roles. They might switch them in and out, but somehow these all show up in addiction. And the minute we get one person better, as much as the family is going to be like, oh, thank God, I want them in treatment, 
The minute we have one person start to switch, the family's in a freak because it wants to maintain homeostasis regardless of how painful that is. It knows how to do it. We're coming in as outsiders. We're shifting. We're rocking the boat. And the boat is sailing sideways and falling over, but we're rocking the boat. So to them, it's like very threatening. So we want to be very aware of that. Um, so psychoeducation is great with families. Like explaining all of this to them um, in treatment is really helpful. Family rules that we'll see in every family we have, some of them are passed down by someone sitting there and going, don't you say anything to anyone. This is private. So they're telling the people that. Some of them are passed down by a look or like we just know this in a family, a myth. It doesn't have to be verbal. It can be that you just know in our family we don't, we don't, um, we don't feel. I can't trust my feelings. We don't share family secrets. Don't admit what you don't know. You'll see families like where the minute someone's like, well, I don't know, the family will jump on them. You have to be like rigid and know what you have, you know, to, to get your point across, you have to be like so strong to out-talk everyone else. So you'll see these dynamics in every family, like where, where is this family in this? Um, of course, don't focus on yourself, only focus on others. When we know it's all self-serving, it's all drowning people clinging to each other in an ocean, like when we think the codependent or the enabler is thinking of the loved one, they're not. They're thinking of themselves and like, how, like they feel like they're dying. So like I have to fix this person. But it's not altruistic. You know, it's, it's self-serving because of fear and panic. So that's what it's like. We're always, um, we pretend we're, we're looking out for each other. What we want to introduce to families is acceptance, that we can't control others. We didn't cause this. We can't cure it. It's OK to be wrong. It's OK to feel your feelings, whatever they are, to think your thoughts, have your opinion, want what you want, talk openly, resolve differences, disagree, see a problem and say it. We want them to learn to trust themselves and, and to um, trust trustworthy people. This looks so good on paper. If you introduce these things to a family, they're going to just go ballistic because it threatens everything of who they are. It's a core, you know, that's, that's what will cause a fragment because it's so different. So we want to really carefully um, start to work on these things. I to, uh, I'm introducing a bunch of things so you can get the slides, be like, oh, that seemed interesting. I want to know more about the Bader-Pearson couples developmental model. <laughs> what that is is approaching couples from a developmental to see where they are developmentally in Erickson's developmental um, stages. The first one is bonding. And this is how you can assess every couple you see. Bonding is when couples meet and they're like, oh my God, you like soft pairs too? That's so amazing. And like, everything's amazing. And you like the same movies. And unfortunately, every couple we see at some point is trying to get back to that. Sorry. They're trying to get back to that stage, which is impossible. It's all chemical. There's no reason to go back to it. But what they do is they usually um, will separate at some point because somebody at work will be like, oh, well, he brings me soup. Like, they're always wanting that again, and they're, they're not realizing it. That's just the first three months. We're on our best behavior. It's chemical. It's great. Then you, the couples get to differentiation, and you start to realize, oh, there are differences between us. Or, oh, you do that? We start to see, like, little cracks in the wall and, like, who someone really is. That's when we decide, do I want a relationship with this person? Um, and if they say, if, you, if there are cracks that you're like, no, I'm good, that's one thing. If it's like, no, this, you know, I, this person's worth it, you get to start, they're practicing, they're, they're starting to like not be so insular, not be so like, I have to see you every minute. You introduce your friends back in, it's like coming and going. Um, this one's very close to rapprochement. When a child is coming and going with the parent, are you still there? And um, couples will start to, to branch out more than come together. What, they want, what you want to get them through is to the last phase, which is, I, I call it like tr when it's transcendent. It's like when couples can stay together through all these phases and stop trying to get back to that original chemical high where you're really projecting a movie on your partner and it's like, oh my God, they're everything. And you, you want, we're searching for that original attachment where mom responded when I cried, mom responded when I was hungry. So in the beginning of a relationship, it looks like that. It's like this person's everything. And people keep trying to get back to that. But the more they can self-soothe, the more we can help them care for themselves, then they can move on to like loving this person for who they are, 
all of who they are, seeing them clearly, seeing all the, the cracks in the mortar, seeing, I'll say to couples all the time, when was the first time you really disappointed each other? When was the first time you looked at her, looked at him, and, was, and were heartbroken? Because they let you down. Maybe not by something they did, maybe by a need they couldn't meet, because they can't do that. But when's the first time you realize that? And so many people are like, that'll be the moment they break up. Because it's like, oh, and they, they want to throw them away. But it's like the more we can take disappointment and still love the person and grow, that's when it becomes transcendent. That's when you have like marriages for decades and decades, where you'll see in a marriage people come together. There's periods when they're further apart and they come back and they go together, but they have that commitment. So I'll always say to couples, I don't care if you love each other. You don't have to tell me you love each other. How committed are you to this? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, how committed are you to working through this? Because it's, it's not an upward marriage. It's like, you know, but it can be doing that going up and getting closer. So what we want to do is we're growing adults. You know, that's what we're doing as therapists. We're growing adults individually as couples and families. Um, so when, a, when a, someone has an insecure attachment, oh my God, it's, I, could be, I could be up here for so long. When someone has an insecure attachment, they're going to look to their, their partner to meet all those needs that they haven't met before, which creates, and if it's a really insecure, if they had like two alcoholic parents, or, or it's been traumatic, or a war, which is very much like having two alcoholic parents, if there's been um, a, a real profound break, it's going to create PTSD symptoms when they don't get those needs met. That's when you start getting to characterological disorders even. So they're going to be, um, there's a great saying in AA, when you're hysterical, it's historical. And it doesn't mean hysterical, like, it's just like when something hits you that hard, you're like, oh my God, and it's so much pain. You know, this is not my partner. This is not this moment. There's a piece of it, but this is old stuff coming up. And that's when you want to go to your therapist and be like, this hit me so hard. So what we're helping couples to develop is an observing self that can sit there and go, so they can say to their partner, oh my God, we're not talking about what we were just talking about anymore. I'm in so much pain. I'm suffering so much. I got to take care of this, then we'll resume the conversation. So that we have to be able to self-soothe when we're hit that hard. Because when we're hit that hard, and it's not like someone just died, or you know, when it's like a little thing, and we're that scared, it's old, it's primal, and it's from like way in our past with an attachment. But I want to get to, you know what the needs are. I give them a sheet. This is what your needs are. I give them sheets because people are like, I don't know. So I'll let them choose through like hundreds of needs and be like, what are our unmet needs? Um, what we're helping with couples and families is um, what needs are realistic and what's not realistic? What, what is environmentally realistic? What's a limit that you have or that your partner has? And it might be, this comes up sometimes, I actually call it gangster therapy sometimes. I had a family come in and I knew they were never gonna come back. And they didn't want the, this daughter to go to the son's wedding because they said she'll ruin it, she'll cause a scene. And I met her and she would have. But as I sat there, I was like, I knew they were never going to come back because mom and dad were not going to hear from me what they wanted to hear. I wasn't going to be like, yeah, she's a demon. So as we're doing this session, I, I looked at her and I said, honey, you got to run. And she was like, what? I said, you have to run. You, and I said to the parents, are you going to see her? Are you going to like, give her what she needs? Now? And they were like, no. It, it, sometimes you have to like, assess quickly and know. And I'm like, you have to grieve to this girl, I'm like, you have to grieve you're not getting the family you want. You have to grieve you're not getting the daughter you want. This isn't about a wedding. You know, that's like the least of their problems. That's what brought them in. But sometimes you know, like, you have a moment where you're like, I'm not going to see this couple, this family again. It's that volatile. So you, sometimes you got to get in there like a gangster and, like, try to make some. I was like, if nothing else, this girl for the first time in her life was seen. So I remember she looked at me just, like, shocked, you know. So if we can even give them an experience of being seen for once. You know, because it was like 10 family members against this poor girl. So it was like no one's ever looked at her and been like, you're in so much pain, you know. And um, then they're not going to see it. It's not, they're not bad people. They can't see it. And their arms are crossed. And they're telling you, I'm not going to see it. So sometimes it's helping people grieve and helping them move on as best they can. Um, so what I do with couples that are super high conflict is I call it the... Um, it's a group in Palo Alto, which is on my slides if you want to know more about their work. The initiator and um, the explorer. So the initiator, I'll say, you're going to bring up one issue. 
you're going to talk about your feelings. Because you've all seen with family, somebody will say, you know, this is really bothering me that you want to move to Wisconsin. Someone's like, well, yeah, you know what, last time you, and you're like, wait, now you're off on something else. Because they'll just go back and forth and, and stay off, you know, explode. So I tell them, you bring up one thing, you only talk about your thoughts and feelings. You're not going to blame, you're not going to accuse, you're not going to finger point. Your only reason to bring this up is self-discovery, not to convince your partner of anything, not to make them see something, not to make them understand. It's, it's, it's saying to ourselves, this is my problem, this is an expression of who I am, this is about me revealing myself and being willing to express my thoughts and feelings. So you have them bring up one issue that way. The other person is going to listen calmly and ask questions. I'll give a great example of this. Um, a, I, have, I had a family once, and the daughter was 18 and said to the mom, I felt abandoned by you my entire life. And I, I knew this family, and the mom had, been at, uh, had cancer. So she was at Sloan Cantering most of her life. She could have easily gone to that and said, I, was, I had cancer treatment my entire life. Like, that would have been true. But she'd been working on this, and she said, you felt abandoned your entire life? What was that like? That sounds so painful. She stayed with the daughter. It didn't mean she put the code on of like, I'm an abandoning mom. Like she knew. It's like in that moment, you stay on the person bringing something up. And you know, even if it hits and it's like, oh my God, my daughter felt that way. You're, you're thinking to yourself, I can take care of this later. I can self-soothe this. I can breathe through this. I can talk about it later. The spotlight is on this other person right now. So both people are seeking self-discovery and to learn more about themselves, not to convince or to prove. Because if the mom said, you know, I was sick growing up your entire life, does that take away the abandonment? Is the girl going to go, oh, that's right, the cancer. Like, I no longer feel abandoned. It doesn't work that way. We're not in a court of law. We're not trying to prove anything. No one's right. We like, we want to know what's your experience because I love you. So the mom could sit with her. And the, the daughter was not allowed to respond. Uh, I mean, the mom was not allowed to respond. A lot of times couples will be with me. And the, the, I had one couple that was so high conflict. And he said something. And she was like, can I respond to that? And I was like, no, you can't. I'm going to sit by you. I'm going I'm to be right next to you. And I'm going to hold this with you. But you can't respond with, yeah, but, or I. You know, I said, she was like, after we're done with this exercise, can I respond? I said, no, next week you get to bring something up. So you're going to hold it that long. So teaching people to hold things and to be like, I'm going to hold this with you. I'm going to help you be a container. It's like the greatest gift we can give them to say, don't talk about this at home. And a lot of times with this, people be like, that's so cool, initiator, inquirer, we're going to do this from now on. I'm like, no, you're going to forget this by the time you get to the door because we're not wired to do this. This is learning a new, you know, it's, it's really hard. So we want to like keep bringing it to someone and being like, hold me through this because we're not, we had decades of exploding and fragmenting and being in pain. So it's very hard to be like, oh, but I have to say this. I have to, if they just knew this, they wouldn't feel that. It's not true. So we want to slow it down for them and be like, you want to find out more about your partner. That's the goal. So I do that a lot. You don't need to do this with couples who aren't in like super high conflict. This is like when, they're, when they can't be in the room together without it exploding. And they're so fragmented and they're in so much pain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so family counseling techniques. Um, let me think of some good ones that are, uh, well, we all know reframing. Sculpting, we do, family, we do family sculpts, we do genograms or help with families. Paradoxical interventions, I like this because I've just been using it lately. You don't want to do this with a family who's pretty compliant, there's no reason to. But if you have somebody who's um, so th adverse to therapy, and so, which is great in addiction because most people are, I have a friend who went to, um, this is a great paradoxical invention, intervention that he did on himself, this is an example. He went to passages in Malibu, I don't know if you know it. It's the antithesis of 12-step, it's anti-12-step. So he went to passages to get sober at 18. And he got there at 18, and he was like, I want to go to an AA meeting every night. And they're like, we don't do AA here. He's like, I want to go to an AA meeting every night. So he made them drive him to an AA meeting every night. He's now 20 years sober in AA. He pulled his own paradoxical intervention on himself because he did the opposite of what the therapeutic team expected. So a lot of times with couples, a paradoxical invention is if they're so stuck 
and, and they're like, we, this isn't going to work out, we're blah, blah. And you're like, I agree, I don't, why are you together? It's not working. Sometimes they're like, well, don't be so fast to say that. I mean, I love him. So sometimes you're jarring them out of their hypnosis, you know. So pulling a paradox when they're super defiant, otherwise it's like, well, otherwise we're just cruel. <laughs> you know what I mean? This isn't going to work. So you're only doing it. I have a client now who's um, living in his car, and I said to him, and this is, I don't know if this is paradox, so I was, I was telling the truth. I said, put my business card in your wallet, please, or on you somewhere, because when they find your body, I want them to call me so I can tell your mother, because I know your mom so well. I know your sister. He was like, it just shook him somehow. And he called me, he said he would, and then he called me back. He said, I'm going to try sober living again. So sometimes we have to really just jar people. I mean, I was telling the truth then, but also it was paradoxical, because it wasn't like, You'll be fine. Just try sober living. I wasn't a cheerleader anymore. I was like, I'm so sorry. I care about you so much. This isn't going to work. You're in your van, you know, and you're using. So um, keep, your, keep my card on you. That's, that's a paradoxical intervention, which is the same as unbalancing. Sometimes it, this is like when you want it, have, have that you've done so much family therapy that you can align with one person in the family and just unbalance the whole thing. So you're really going to advocate for one person that's going to shake everything up. That's when you want to do all these things when you've done so much family therapy, you know, because you don't want to go in there and tinker with that kind of thing. So solution-focused <laughs> is non-pathologizing. You're working with, when I work with families, I'm working on strengths the whole time, not the weaknesses. We can see the weaknesses, we can see, but you just want to validate the strengths with them because that, that part of the brain is always going to light up more or be more open to trying something. Um, <clears throat> I'll ask them a lot, like, what have you done in the past? When is, what have you done that's working? Um, when, when doesn't this happen? Let me see. Does some good. You'll have all these slides if you want. The miracle question, do you, have, do you do the miracle question at all? It's a solution focused that's so jarring to the brain, it's so good to use. A lot, because people come in knowing what needs to happen. He needs to get sober. He needs to stop using. She needs to get off my back. They know, they think they know what needs to happen. So the miracle question is, when you say to somebody, how would you know tomorrow morning if you woke up and this wasn't a problem anymore, it was all gone, how would you know? Like, what would you be feeling? What would you be seeing? What would you be doing that would tell you, oh, my God, the problem's gone? Not what they're doing. What would you be feeling and doing? So it's almost hypnotic where people are like, God, well, I would wake up, and I wouldn't be so obsessed, and I would feel like going to work, and I would feel some joy in my life. And it gets them, like, thinking of possibilities. So it's not staying on, here's the problem, how do I, like, beating a dead horse, you know? So the miracle question is a way to, and you can do this for 45 minutes with someone, how to really frame, like, what, how would you know if you woke up tomorrow and this problem is gone? What would you be seeing in your life? What would be different? Um, it starts to work on a different part of the brain. It starts to light up things that have been pretty dark for a while with addiction. Oh my God, a few minutes. Okay. Family is expert, always. I always think the family is the greatest expert um, of their own pain, of, their, of where they need to go. Um, when, when working with family, because a lot of times they are like, here, fix them, they're not interested, I always say it would really help me if you could tell me what I need to know about your loved one to better serve them. Like, oh. So you want to like rope them in any way that you can to get them to start to be involved. So a lot of it's like, what can you tell me about your family member that'll help me help them? And then they can start to open up and you can see where they need help. But it's a way, the main thing is you want to engage everyone in the family that you can. So that's seeing them as the expert and trusting them. Um, using countertransference, I don't know if that's a word here, um, there is English. <laughs> um, using the countertransference, I think, is the greatest thing we have. Like, if you have a client where you're like, Ugh, like it's them, I'm like, oh, why am I not, why am I feeling disengaged? Why am I not excited about this session? They're probably feeling really disengaged. So you know a lot what's going on inside your client by how you feel when you're about to see them. Um, what, sometimes I've done this, I've done this a lot, actually, and I haven't had it go wrong, so I'm telling you, try it once you know a family. Um, one, one example is I had a family, and the dad, it was a big family, it promises, and the youngest daughter said, you went on trips with every one of my brothers and sisters. You went to Africa, you went to all these places, you never went anywhere with me. 
And um, they had not been doing the initiator and the inquiry. He's like, I've been so busy with you. You were the youngest, like he's explaining. And I was like, you want to try again? And I'm trying to help him, but he couldn't see beyond. If I could just make her see, I was busy. And I was like, and finally I said to him his name. We'll call him Tom. And I was like, Tom, can I be you for a second? He was like, yeah, go ahead. So I got down in front of his daughter, and I said, I'm so sorry that I didn't take you on the same trips. I never wanted you to not feel as important to me and as precious and as much loved a daughter as my other children. And she was crying. He was like, yeah, that. But sometimes our clients can't access that because it wasn't in their language. So sometimes you, we can see what's under all that. So I, I love stepping in just saying, can I be you for a second? And then just jumping in. And it, it's always worked. I, and if it didn't, I'd say, like, I'm sorry. <laughs> sometimes I'm wrong. Let me try again. It's OK to be wrong. I love being wrong with clients because they see somebody be wrong, admit it, and try something else. OK. All right, we're wrapping up. Um, here's my clicker. We're going to skip the parts party. Virginia Satir is amazing. I Google her. But I want to leave you with this. So the, our job is the healing right now. It's, it's on the front line of this disease. It's to get to the truth of the matter. It requires us as clinicians to be uncomfortable, to, to sit with them in their pain, to be fearless, to, to confront this ugly, destructive, dangerous um, disease that's alcoholism and drug addiction. Um, we're looking at the shame-based system. We have to look at economic, uh, social, psychological, religious. I didn't do an intro because we're, we're so short on time, but I worked with um, Palestinian and Syrian refugees a lot, and I worked on American Indian reservations. So um, a lot of like complex trauma. We, we want to look at the whole picture, not the individual, like, oh, what's wrong with you? I, I don't believe in looking at an individual alone or a family alone. I want to know their religious beliefs, their ethnicity, their family, as much as I can about someone, because we're all connected. So it's a community issue, not like a family issue. Um, and the efforts to address this problem has to be led by us. It has to be led by people who have a fund fundamental understanding of alcohol abuse and dependence based on personal recovery and on knowledge, and on having gone to, to, to school and being clinicians. So if we have people who have both, we can lead the way in this. Um, treatment will change if we are relentless and we are on the front lines and we keep reaching out to help families. And we have to keep doing things like this and establish forums. Um, we have to come with guidelines together. We have to work together constantly. That, that's one thing we're good at in the United States is networking, endless networking, endless getting together. So I, I believe that's a good thing. And, and um, I work with a bunch of treatment centers in the States. If anyone ever needs an interventionist, an aftercare treatment center anywhere in the world, I've been to like 163 treatment centers touring them. I work with about 10. Um, I can find anything for you anywhere. You could call me and say, I need a therapist in Zimbabwe. I feel like we have to know everything because there's people everywhere that need our help so desperately. So we're the front line of ending this stigma and focusing on solutions and strengthen families um, to end the suffering of addiction. Thank you.